All right, well, hey guys. Um, <clears throat> all 300,000 of my uh, YouTube subscribers. Uh, okay, so we're gonna continue on today with the blues and I believe in the introduction to the blues on this playlist, I spoke about uh, the nine or 10 different blues clues. Um, and uh, today we're gonna discuss one of the very, very, very important blues clues, uh, minor under major. Okay, uh, I've decided to, I think what I'm going to do at the end of this series is uh, work with the, uh, the established 12-bar uh, blues and uh, show you guys how some of the principles I teach would work against that. Okay, so uh, I have said before, the blues is unimaginably important to contemporary music, and yet the academics barely acknowledge it. However, there are some academics out there that are really um, open-minded. Don't forget, the, the academics tended toward classical music, and uh, contemporary academics are exposed to every form of music, so they have to, at some point, begin to acknowledge these other forms. I want to recommend a, a Music Theory YouTube channel that, in some respects, is a little heavy, um, uh, but there's really enlightening moments in it. And uh, this would be Rick Beato, uh, R-I-C-K, Rick uh, Beato, like beat with an O. And uh, I thought he was out here in L.A., but I think he mentioned he's in Atlanta. Uh, in any case, I consider this guy to be one of the greatest modern music educators um, that's come along since Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein was phenomenal. Uh, he was very much the academic and he knew everything in and out about classical music. But he, he also was, as any good musician would be, open-minded to other musical forms. And therefore he, at the time he was uh, doing his lectures, his famous Harvard series, which you, if you've seen the um, Leonard Bernstein Harvard lectures, if you haven't seen them, you must. It's, it's absolute brilliance. And he's basically teaching uh, music to, um, it's basically like music appreciation. He's teaching to people, Harvard students who aren't music majors that don't maybe know a whole hell of a lot about music, but wants to give them them an inside look. Anyway, I would call Rick Beato um, the next great uh, uh, teacher of music, uh, music appreciation, music theory. Um, it's interesting because we're very, very different, uh, me and Rick. Rick has an immense background of education. Me, I've never admitted this to anyone, but I'll admit it to the public right now on YouTube that my degree in music is merely an associate's degree. I didn't even go as far as a bachelor's because back in those days in the 70s, I thought I was just going to, you know, get out of graduate college, get in a limo and proceed to Madison Square Garden where I'd be with my hit band. You know, that didn't happen. Uh, so mistake there. I should have gone on with my studies, but Think about this. If you take a, a great um, alternative researcher, the likes of uh, James Corbett, for example, um, James is obviously not mainstream, obviously enough, but yet he's a meticulous researcher and probably along the way and along all of his researching, he learned a great deal about history. and. Uh, uh, maybe comparable to academic history teachers. So my point being this, although I don't have the, the uh, intense education, I would, like James, researched uh, heavily, but not into history, but into music and music theory. Now, so one of the big differences between me and Rick is that Rick kind of micromanages, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, but he kind of micromanages musical elements. This is why he can pick up a piano or a guitar and just kind of play the licks from one particular song. My approach is completely different. I take a very big wide picture view of the whole system. And in fact, I believe there are a few things I could show Rick that he'd uh, be interested in and probably learn from, uh, as well as he could do the same for me. I mean, he's, a, like I said, a brilliant guy. So Rick Beato, uh, he has a whole series on ear training, which I would recommend. Uh, the guy's brilliant. He's utterly brilliant and he's so passionate and dedicated to music. And people that are passionate and dedicated to music, I have a special place in my heart for them because I'm passionate and dedicated. There's nothing more I love than understanding more and more and more about music and being able to uh, communicate that to other people uh, 
All right. So my preamble over, I do want to mention real quick, somebody, uh, somebody, I don't think he's a subscriber landed on my channel and he made a comment. I've been searching for blues on YouTube and there's just too many people talking. Well, don't go to a music theory channel if you don't want to hear talking. You know, you have to understand this stuff intellectually before you understand it any other way. And how are you going to learn beside, you know, aside from sp people speaking to you and giving you ideas and thoughts? Uh, but anyway, be that the case, I'm going to proceed on. Now, these blues clues, really, there's not a whole hell of a lot to talk about with each clue. Uh, minor under major. First of all, let's talk about why minor under major and what that means. That's a recent term I've developed, okay? Minor under major means the predominating uh, situation is major and minor is uh, subservient to that major. Uh, when I get into uh, the parallel relative switch, I'm going to show you how an actual major key could be minor to another key uh, it, it, by comparison. It's really interesting and it's connected, strangely enough, with the blues, which is strangely enough connected with the very ancient development of the harmonic and melodic minor scales. Um, now, minor under major, when you think of uh, root and what has root power, okay, if I have a chord, let's say a C chord, okay, uh, comprised of the note C, E, G, the most powerful note of those three notes would be the C itself or what's called the root. If I play E, G, C in that order, uh, it really drops to that C. It wants to come back. Okay, those are the three notes of C, C, E, and G. Now, if I just have a C note, right, that could be drawn by any, that could be pulled into any number of chords, okay? For example, if I have a C note, it could be pulled in by the A minor chord, because why? There's a C note in the A minor chord. It could be pulled in by the A flat chord, because that is the third of the A flat major chord. OK, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are uh, three major triads that will contain a C. There are three minor triads that will contain a C. OK, if you want to hear them all, let me see if I can do them. Uh, a minor. F minor. And uh, C minor. Three major triads are C major, A flat major, and F major. All right, now, point being here that the the chord is like you can think of it as like okay, there are three notes to the chord. It's like three people. The C note itself is just one note. So if you're talking about a street fight, the C note against the a flat C, uh, E flat, the A flat chord, the A flat chord is going to win. It's going to pull in that C note, okay? Uh, so the point being that chords have more root power and more, they're like, a, I, I, the analogy I give is that a chord is like a, gravi a miniature gravitation unit. It, it creates gravity and pulls things into it, especially related notes and uh, chords uh, from within the key that comes from. So, uh, a chord has more power than a note does in terms of drawing root. Why is this important? Well, in the case of minor under major, it's the chords that are major based and the uh, scale itself, separate notes of the scale are minor. So the chords have precedence. Uh, so basically the idea here is I have a chord progression that's major based um, and I'm playing a minor scale against it. And the case of the blues, it's a minor pentatonic scale. The diatonic scales is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, the diatonic scales don't sound as bluesy when you work with them, okay? Um, all right, so now this question of uh, major chords. First of all, when we think of blues, it's not so much major we're thinking of, we're thinking of the dominant seventh chord, which for all intents and purposes, 
is a major chord, but it has one note, extra note tacked to that major chord. Um, I'm going to do on my other uh, playlist, major minor key system, I'm going to show how you should build the triads, rather than having triads, build chords up to four notes. Uh, this way you could get an idea of what is major, what is minor, and what is dominant seventh, okay? And I'll, I'll hit that another time. Now, I, I often say that major chords can be disguised seventh chords. They're, they don't have the seventh, but they're acting like. So it's possible for me to play a blues with major chords. Uh, let me lay down a loop and, and show you that. <coughs> Sounds a little plain vanilla, you know, with the major chord. This, by the way, is a 12-bar blues, and you may recognize it. All right, so here's my progression. Now I'm playing, this is a G, and I'm playing my G minor pentatonic. So you see how, even though the blues is normally, I'm playing a G major, a C major, and a D major, the blues normally is G7, C7, and D7. But you can see how the blues can actually, um, uh, the, the seventh chords can actually just be, you can get away with majors, and it will sound enough like blues where you can play blues against it. All right, uh, so I say minor under major because the seventh chord is at its basis a major chord, okay? All right, so uh, minor under major, um, it's, I notice as a principle in music where minor is always subservient to major. Major is more overpowering, and the minor has to follow it. And I'm going to prove that to you. I played G minor pentatonic with the, the uh, G7, C7, and D7 chord. What if I was to reverse the situation, play a G minor chord, and play a G major pentatonic, your ears are going to hurt. I'm going to play a, a very short version of a minor blues and play major pentatonic against it. Be prepared. It's not pretty. So there's my minor progression. Here we go. I'm sorry about this. long it's just really painful for some reason well there is a specific reason why major under minor does not work and that's uh, something I call the minor ninth rule which I hit on uh, in um, in my uh, major minor key system series uh, second level theory uh, minor ninth this is another really important principle especially when it comes to chord inversion and this is something I'll never teach you in music school um, uh, but it's ex potently important. There are a few principles in music that are really need to be understood. One is the parallel relative concept. One is the uh, minor ninth rule. Um, there's a few of them. All right, so anyway, the um, minor under major. So if I play a G7 chord, I get that scale played over it. Now, if I leave that high note against the G7 chord, what I get here is a G7 sharp 9 chord. All right? And, oddly enough, when I go to the D7 chord, the 5-7 in this uh, blues progression, when I play my pentatonic scale there, hit that uh, 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 F note against that D7 chord, I get a D7 sharp 9. So it actually builds two different sharp 9 chords in the progression. 
this is important. And one of the blues clues is indeed the sharp nine chord, which I'm going to hit down the line. Um, all right. So uh, there's not a hell of a lot to say about this. I mean, really, you're playing a minor pentatonic against a major situation. Now, the true art of blues is, well, the G is a G7 is major bass chord. So it's also possible to play the G major pentatonic against it. But you notice it sounds a little plain vanilla and certainly not very bluesy. Not only that, but the major pentatonic is specific to the chord you're on. In other words, I, I just use a G major pentatonic. When the C major, when the C7 chord comes in, God forbid I stay with that G major pentatonic. Not good. All right, so here's my major. All right, so every time you heard that bad note, it was when that C7 came in. Reason being, the C7 has a B-flat note, and I'm playing a B-natural note from the G major pentatonic. Now, given that, from the three, the three chords in a 12-bar blues, G, in this case the key of G, not the key of G, the root G7, um, there's no such thing as a blues in a key. It's just rooted somewhere. Uh, G7, C7, and D7 are the three chords. Um, so uh, what happens here is that your G minor pentatonic, your standard blues thing, works against all three chords. So here we go with the three chords again of the blues. And I'm going to shorten this whole thing because time purposes. So is how G minor pentatonic, okay, the minor against the major root chord, which is G7, uh, is global to all three chords. It's what I call a through scale. You can play through all the chords with that one scale. I'll demonstrate it. some really simple licks here like it's I'm I'm trying to stay with the G minor pentatonic all right now we have the G7 the C7 the D7 upon which you could play G minor pentatonic all the way through but there are scales specific to each chord all right meaning that scale can only be used for that particular chord when the chord comes up so for the G7 I could use G major pentatonic for the C7, I could use C major pentatonic. And for the D7, I could use D major pentatonic. But bearing in mind that the G minor is also global throughout. So what that means is when I have a G7 chord, I can blend, and blues is about key blending. I can blend the G minor with the G major pentatonic. I can blend, when the C7 comes up, I could blend the G minor, which is global, G minor pentatonic, with the C major pentatonic, and when D7 comes up, I could blend the G minor pentatonic with the D major pentatonic. This is called uh, mixing minor and major, and this is where the deeper art of the blues happens. And I'm going to show you an improv where I'm going to be mixing the G minor global pentatonic with the specific scales for each chord, G major, C major, and D major. <laughs>
did throw the blue note in there, and that's a discussion. That's the other one of the other blues clues. I'll be talking about the blue note at a later time. But you can hear how much more uh, sophisticated uh, the improvisation becomes when you begin to blend the global G minor pentatonic with the specific scales for each chord. All right. So uh, that is, you know, uh, that guy complaining about too much talk. Um, yeah, if you go just watch a blues player, uh, most of them can't think beyond that one G minor global pentatonic, but the truly deep blues musicians understand the principle of minor to major and how to mix that. Um, on the G set, on the G7, the third of the chord is what gives me the major sound, right? If it was a flat third, it'd sound minor. But the blues mixes that major with that minor. All right. Uh, so, uh, oh, what was I getting to? Um, yeah, uh, oh, for that guy that, com uh, that was complaining. Uh, you know, uh, it's like if you want to watch some blues players, it's going to be a, a coin toss whether you actually hear somebody that knows how to get around the blues in, in the more sophisticated, deeper levels of the blues. All right, so uh, yeah, yeah, excuse me for talking, but that's the only way to communicate, <laughs> aside from telepathy, and I don't know how to do that yet, so... Hmm, I think that's about it. Minor against major. I'm going to throw out one more blues clue, and here's a really weird thing. I said against the D7, I could use my global G minor pentatonic and my D major pentatonic. Right? Uh, but the strange thing about the D7 is that I could also use D minor pentatonic against that. All right, that, uh, you know, people have asked me about the four chord, the C7. Can I play C minor pentatonic against that? No, you cannot, and it sounds like shit. And the reason why is um, the minor note of C minor, which is an E flat natural, okay? That, uh, if we think about seventh chords pointing to major keys, the G7 points to the key of C. Is there an E flat in the key of C? No. The C7 chord points to the key of F. Is there an E flat in the key of F? No. The D7 points to the key of G major. Is there an E flat in that key? No. So this E flat note is black sheep of the family, cannot fit in there. It can be used as a grace note in a passing tone, um, which I, actually I was going to get to. The third of each chord is where the blues convention lies. So if I play a G major triad, and I want to get the blues sound, I move from the minor to the major, to the, and here I'm going root, minor, major, fifth. Now it gets to the C7 where I can play that e, e flat note is that the third of the C7, which is an E note, the blue note against that chord is an E flat. So. That'll work fine. If you just did against this, uh, the C7 and the C minor pentatonic will not work. It just sounds cheesy and like you don't know what you're doing. All right, now against the D7, we have the third. And again, we do the flat uh, three to three convention. That one little tweak against all three chords, if you know where the third of the chord is while you're improvising, that one little tweak will make it sound eminently like blues. Okay, so that's minor against major. Uh, when I discuss the sharp nine chord, we'll get more in-depth look at uh, blues harmony and the essential uh, chord of blues harmony, which is indeed the sharp nine chord. Okay, all right, so that's it for today. I know I was blathering about other stuff and whatever, but that's me. All right, anyway. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll be talking to you soon. Sorry it's been a while. That's because my life is uh, a series of one crisis after another. I'm just, like, getting off the final wave of the last crisis that hit me. I finally got a new car, finally got a new phone, and my teeth are still in my head, thank God. So that's about it, guys. Uh, be well, and uh, I'll be uh, talking to you soon. Take care.